Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending August 23rd. This first article was sent in by my friend Cliff Loudpipes. This is uh, from dailymail.co.uk, but I'm going to give you a couple of extra links too to explore because this story gets a little bit more involved. Plankton found in space. Sea creatures are discovered living on the exterior of the International Space Station. This goes back to an experiment the Russians were doing even more than a year ago, and they published some of the results a year ago about it. Now the news have just picked up on one aspect of it, and uh, I'll just give you some parts from the article here. Sea plankton were not carried by the craft as they aren't native to Baikonur, Kazakhstan, where the Russian modules of the station blasted off. What they're thinking and one of the ideas they have is possibly some air currents could actually drift up as high as 260 miles into space and actually be um, the cause of the plankton sticking to the outside of the International Space Station. Uh, it's interesting because if you read the second article, um, the second link that I'm going to give you, there's a little bit of a contention as to uh, the astronauts really aren't talking much about it, and even the NASA astronauts are not really, as far as this experiment, which makes sense, they're not really collaborating. It's a Russian experiment, so the NASA astronauts really know nothing about this uh, plankton thing or um, not even discussing it or anything. So um, more or less, maybe it could be because of a slow news day that they got into this, but nonetheless, it is an interesting article, and uh, it tells you what kind of creatures can possibly survive in outer space. I mean, you're talking about the outside of the International Space Station, and they're um, cleaning off uh, sensor areas and windows and stuff like that, and they're getting a uh, quite a variety of different microscopic particles and things like that. It seems like the major source of particle contamination on the outside of the International Space Station, though, has nothing to do with uh, any kind of living organisms, more to do with the fact that when rockets get near the International Space Station, they um, obviously have to uh, use maneuvering thrusters, so there's uh, quite a bit of fuel and uh, water contamination just from the fact of having to burn combustibles near the International Space Station. So the major source actually is rocket fuel and uh, combustion byproducts on the International Space Station. But uh, it also leads to some other uh, things that they talk about in the article, too, about the fact that uh, it gives them more information on how to grow plants, uh, possibly in harsher conditions such as Mars or such as using meteorite for uh, soil to grow plants and stuff like that. So. If you get a chance, check it out. There'll be three links total to do with this if you want to actually read on the whole thing and get an idea of actually what's going on. And next up, will this burger bot smash America's fast food jobs? The uh, Around the news media, you've probably been seeing it's been going on for, I think, close to almost a year about people talking about robot cashiers. When you go to like a uh, McDonald's or something like that, you will have a, a robot cashier to... Uh, take your order and stuff like that. So uh, this is different, though. This is a robot that actually makes the burgers themselves and the sandwiches. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it, would, it obviously is going to take the jobs away of the cooks pretty much. But on the other hand, too, the chances of getting your order wrong are pretty um, are, are lessened, I think, at least with that. I mean, it seems like when I go to McDonald's, if I make any kind of special order, ask them to add something or take away something from the sandwiches, they inevitably get it wrong. So I guess this way with a robot type of sandwich maker, um, it would take, I guess, uh, a little over a year to pay for itself because it's probably not going to be very cheap. But they also say they could uh, save money by including more varieties of stuff, too, if you wanted instead of uh, just carrying burgers and uh, fish sandwiches and chicken sandwiches, they could also get into a little bit more exotic stuff. You could have a bison burger or something like that or a combination of a pork and hamburger. Uh, basically, the machine can just spit it out in whatever way you want. So you want a specialty type of sandwich done just to your particular way, um, this robot's going to be able to do it. So, uh, I don't know. I see that coming possibly, I could see that coming maybe even faster than the robot cashiers myself, but um, I don't know. It's going to be kind of weird if I live to see the day where I walk into a McDonald's or a Burger King and there are no human beings. It's uh, robot order takers and robot sandwich makers. Um, then you get to the point of saying, well, um, how are you going to pay for it? Then if nobody's got jobs, who's going to walk into it and buy from the robots in the first place? Interesting, nonetheless. Uh, this next one's from 1954 Shadow. This is Motherboard.com. NASA's next rocket is so big, the sound of its launching could damage buildings. They had to deal with this with the Saturn rockets back during the Apollo era, too. Those rockets were just so big and so powerful. What happened was they had to, um, the building, the assembly building was three miles away from the launch pad. But nonetheless, these sound waves were so powerful because sound waves 
it's not just the sound you're hearing, it's the fact that these are actual mechanical waves. They're actually pushing large volumes of air and they're pushing it and making sound vibrations that can basically bring down buildings. I mean, you're talking about the amount of power that can bring down a building. So what they had to do is put special aluminum insulated panels on the outside of these assembly buildings for the Saturn V rockets. Well, you're talking about another step up from these Saturn V rockets when we get into the new launch craft that we're going to be using in the future and that's going to be coming online very shortly so they're going to have to deal with that and uh, one of the techniques they use the, the, also the fact that they mentioned the article too not just the buildings themselves but think about these engines are going to have astronauts sitting on top of them in a space capsule they're going to be subject to these sounds these vibrations and stuff like that I guess what they use for dampening now to help it out is they use water because these sound waves going into uh, volumes of water actually slow down and make them a little bit less forceful uh, it says here, one test, <clears throat> let's see, Saturn V used five F1 engines to generate 7.5 million pounds of thrust. One test registered about 204 decibels. With more recent rockets, which generate between 100,000 and 650,000 pounds of thrust, typically generate around 195 decibels. And the SLS in 2017 will be bigger than the Saturn, well, they don't give exact figures, but just as bigger than Saturn V generating more power at launch and having a correspondingly High, higher power profile. But you also got to realize too, engineering between the Saturn production in the 1960s, engineering is really caught up too. So I think some of the techniques we have to deal with sound and deal with uh, mechanical stress have uh, advanced enormously. And some of the materials now we have to work with, like your carbon fibers, your nanomaterials, stuff like that. Um, NASA evidently is going to have the budget to do it. So I think they're going <clears> to <throat> also have the engineering and the capability to do it. And uh, Last up, Galileo satellites wrong orbit. The Galileo system is a system similar to our U.S. GPS system that is being put up by Europe. A lot of countries, and I don't blame them, and groups of countries, after this thing with Snowden and the United States spying even on uh, prime ministers and presidents of countries that were supposedly our allies, they don't really want to rely on the United States GPS system, especially since we have the ability to switch the uh, reliability down if we want, the accuracy down, and even turn it off if we want to. So these countries don't want that to happen. This Galileo is going to be a civilian type program, but uh, the Chinese are getting on board with the program to uh, have their own GPS type of system as are uh, India and Russia actually at one time had one before the Cold War. Uh, they just let it go and didn't work on it anymore, but I guess their plan, their plan on is getting it back up and running again too. Um, can't say as I blame them, they say these systems may end up uh, working with some of the newer GPS devices, too, to be able to uh, give more accuracy. The Galileo satellites, for example, have one advantage over our GPS satellites. They are going at different types of altitude. So when you actually get an altitude readout on your GPS, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but my GPS altitude readings, sometimes they're plus or minus 100 or 200 feet. They're just, they don't seem to be that accurate in the same position time after time. They just... The accuracy level is poor to say the best, maybe even horrible. And these Galileo satellites being in the correct orbits uh, or being in different altitude orbits are going to be able to give you better positioning. But unfortunately, um, these two launches of the 30, these last two launches, went up in too low of an orbit. Uh, there's no explanation from them now on these Galileo satellites if it's still salvageable or not. They have control of the satellites, but will they still be able to either operate them at this lower altitude and just go on like nothing happened? Is there enough uh, fuel on board for repositioning that they could actually bring them up to the correct altitude? Um, none of that's being answered right now as far as the Galileo program, but I wish them well with the 30 satellites totally plan on uh, launching by the time this is all finished. Um, I myself am rather suspicious of just trusting the U.S. government for navigation and, and nothing else. It would be nice to have uh, a GPS system on board your car that relies on more than just uh, the U.S. GPS systems and maybe uh, two other countries at least besides just to, just to double check and keep your accuracy a little bit better. So anyway, that's about it for this week, everybody. Take care, and I will catch you next week.